Oh. Hey, Don't Forgetters, welcome to the Don't Forget oh. Yoga Podcast, helping playful yoga teachers absorb yogic wisdom with music, mantra, and the mics. Don't forget on the yoga podcast, music and mantra and it's been a minute, as they say, since the last episode, and I've been helping a friend who had a drug addiction. He went to rehab. He came back from rehab. He had some ketamine-assisted therapy in the rehab, and unfortunately, when he came back, he got a little addicted to ketamine, so helped him get through that. <laughs> it's quite a journey. Slip slides, back slides, front slides slides to the sides ups and downs but it was a really powerful journey i learned a lot i think i'm a different person that's the path of yoga right so i want to tell that whole story in a future episode but right now i have a backlog of interviews really good interviews and i want to share those first so today's episode we have a really amazing woman victoria moran she's been practicing yoga since the year I was born, she is a author, a podcaster. She's written a movie script that she's working on getting out into the world. She founded the Main Street Vegan Academy, where she helps vegan activists start businesses and do all kinds of cool stuff in the world. She wrote a book called The Main Street Vegan. She has all kinds of things going on. I can't even remember them all. And... She's going to tell you about them. <laughs> and she's also going to share with us some really fun ways to remember the Sanskrit names of yoga poses. She just did, at age 70, another yoga teacher training. Just to keep that part of her brain going, as we get older, it's so important to keep learning, right? We need that neuroplasticity, as they say. So... Without further ado, I'd really love to get going on this show. So here's Victoria and I, and thanks for listening. Victoria Moran, welcome to the Don't Forget Yoga podcast. I'm so happy to be here, and good reminder not to forget yoga. <laughs> Don't forget not to forget. We've known each other um, probably... 12, 15 years, somewhere in there. Oh, I would say at least that, yeah. I met you in New York City when I used to live there, and we know each other through the vegan world because we're both vegan activists, and it turns out we're also both yogis. Good combination. Now, I've heard that you began practicing in 1967, is that That's true? when I discovered yoga, and back then you actually had to discover it. So I was living in my right. hometown, Kansas City, Missouri, and there were three books in the Kansas City, Missouri Public Library, and I read them over and over again. So anybody who's a historian and wants to know, one was called Yoga, Youth, and Reincarnation by a New York journalist, Jess Stern, and he went up to Cambridge, Massachusetts and lived with his teacher, an American woman. She'd had an Indian uh, teacher, and he just wrote about his transformation and then there were two books by Indra Devi, who is this fabulous Russian woman credited with bringing certainly Hatha yoga uh, to the West in the early part of the 20th century. And those books were called Forever Young, Forever Healthy and Yoga for Americans. And the one thing that they all three said and had, had in common was if you want to be serious about yoga, you have to be a vegetarian. So that started kind of working in my head. <laughs> Wow. Well, we have a we have a lot of coincidence here. I was born in 1967 in St. Louis, Missouri. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. While you were practicing yoga, I was <laughs> coming out of the womb. Cool. <laughs> I didn't live there. I only lived there less than a year of my life, so I don't remember it, but that's pretty interesting. Well, it gives you Midwestern roots, which I I think there's something very good about that. It's very grounding. Yeah, humble. Um, and Indra Devi, she, she was known as kind of the yogi to the stars and Hollywood elites and things, right? Yes. And, you know, as I was thinking about, you know, your your thing about how we remember asanas, the easiest one for me is Devi Asana, 
for uh, goddess pose because I think of Indra Devi and her biography. Wonderful, wonderful book. I so recommend it if you just like a really good story. And certainly if you're interested in, in some of the modern origins of, of yoga and that book is called The Goddess Pose. Oh, wow. The book is called The Goddess <laughs> Pose. <laughs> that's neat. And that's the uh, the wide leg stance with the... Yes. <laughs> That's one of my favorite poses, actually. It's a very comforting pose. I've heard it called f fierce goddess pose, too. Uh -huh. Well, I guess if you're a goddess, you can choose to be gentle or fierce. Yep, Durga or Kali. So 1967, and then when did you change to becoming vegetarian and vegan? Well, in 1968, I graduated high school and left for London. That was my great dream. And when I got there, I discovered a couple of things. Watkins Books, if anybody travels to London, near Trafalgar Square, there's a tiny little street called Cecil Court. And on that little street, it's a walking street, you can't get a car in there. There are only bookshops and map shops. So England. And one mm -hmm. of these bookshops, Watkins, specializes in spirituality, esotericism, history of religions, all that kind of thing. I wandered in there and my world just burst open. There are more than three books about yoga. <laughs> and probably <laughs> at Watkins or somehow I found my first yoga teacher. And it was so much easier to think about seriously becoming vegetarian in London then than in the Midwest. And now Kansas City is a great vegan town. You could go vegan overnight and just do great and have all kinds of support, wonderful restaurants, the only cafe gratitude outside California, but not so much back then. But London ha had it together for, for being vegetarian, there were vegetarian restaurants. There's a whole chain called Cranks that were restaurants and health food stores. So I got off all <laughs> land animals while I was in England and came back to the States and let go of fish and became an actual vegetarian at 19. I had not heard of veganism. I didn't know what that was. And when I did hear about it a couple of years later, it made all kinds of sense, but I just couldn't do it. It, it seemed extreme. It was difficult. What on earth would you eat? Plus I was dealing with a binge eating disorder. It was, it was very complicated. But I knew I wanted it, so I made little kind of strides in that direction. And ultimately, in 1983, after my daughter was born, I just had to go vegan because I wanted to raise her vegan. And I couldn't very well say, hey, you do this, and I'll go over here and have a cheese sandwich. <laughs> yeah, hypocrisy, you find out when you're raising <laughs> you a kid. Feel good. <laughs> All the things that you're <laughs> trying to keep suppressed come out. Is your daughter still vegan? She is. And she is oh, a wow. stunt performer and an aerialist. Whoa. Yeah, she and her husband are both cast in Marvel Universe Live. So in that show, she's um, an aerialist and she also plays Rocket Raccoon. And they're touring uh, the Middle East and Australia for the next year. And all those oh, muscles so come from plants. Wow. Rocket. <laughs> I, the Guardian of the Galaxy yeah. raccoon is a yeah, <laughs> and, and a rocket costume weighs a lot because it has a jetpack. Wow. You get to fly when you're rocket, but you've also got to carry that heavy thing. <laughs> wow, that yeah, <laughs> I could go down a rabbit hole with rocket, but I guess we should stay on track. <laughs> well, he does have a history in vivisection, so very very oh, good yeah. character for an animal advocate to play. Yeah, the last Guardian of the Galaxy movie went into his whole origin story, and it was definitely had some animal rights <laughs> uh, themes running through it. So you went vegan in 83, and you've been practicing yoga all this time, or was it kind of an on and off? Well, thing? you know, it really has been kind of on and off in terms of Hatha yoga. But um, for me, yoga is really Raja yoga. It's really the internal, what is the most important thing in life I have been taught and I firmly believe to discover who I am, 
to really come to know and grow into this knowledge that I am the eternal Atman. And I get up in the morning with all my flaws and foibles and everything <laughs> that I can point to in my life that is less than where I want it to be. And it's like, I am the eternal Atman. Are you kidding? But no, <laughs> you know, we're, we're not kidding. And, and to grow into that is just so important. So that whole spiritual journey has has just been my entire life and that I've never let go of. And I've kind of gone in different little interesting paths. There's a wonderful phrase from a theologian called Marcus Bach, and he talks about being a vagabond in the wonderful world of spirit. He was um, a Protestant minister and and decided, discovered that that was just, you know, it just boxed him in too much. He needed to be a vagabond in the world of spirit. And and I've been a little bit that way. My uh, bachelor's degree is in comparative religions. And I've just done all kinds of things and lived at the Theosophical Society and worked there actually on a couple of occasions. I worked in the library for a couple of years when I was very young. And then when I was a little bit older, I worked in their publishing house and, you know, traveled a lot in India and Tibet and met the Dalai Lama. So then, of course, you got to look at Buddhism and you got to look at <laughs> Jainism if you're a vegan because they've got ahimsa, you know, to the nth degree. But for me, yoga philosophy is what I always come back to. That is the basis of my worldview. So in terms of Hatha yoga, you're right, off and on. What I learned was Shivananda style Hatha yoga. And I thought that was all there was because that's what I learned from my teacher in England. And then I came back to Kansas City and integral yoga had arrived there. So that's also that Shivananda lineage. And I was just doing that for several years. And then all of a sudden, one day I went to a class somewhere and they were just moving all through the postures and they weren't stopping and they weren't resting. And it was like, what? What, what is this heresy? Because vinyasa, that was a whole other way of doing things. And then, you know, discovered Iyengar and Ashtanga and Anyasara. And it's all cool. I still do what I was taught. And what's kind of funny about my story is I got into it so young. Stella gave me permission to teach beginners when I left England and came back to the States because in those days... They didn't have yoga teacher training. There was no yoga alliance. There was no certification. Your teacher told you when you were ready and then when you were ready to go to the next level and teach more advanced people. So that happened way back when. And I never did yoga teacher training. I mean, I was busy. I was doing other things. I've been writing books and giving talks and running a vegan academy. So it's like, I don't need another thing to do. <laughs> but then this thing happened in 2020 that locked us all up for a year. And I'm home trying to live from home and be creative and productive here. And then all of a sudden, I got an email about yoga teacher training via Zoom. <laughs> And it's like, yes, yes, this is the time. So I was 70 years old when I took my yoga teacher training. And these things that you talk about with how do you remember all that Sanskrit? Believe me, remembering it at 70 can be a little bit challenging. That's why these are good ideas. Well, you seem like you're sharp as a tack. I don't, <laughs> I don't think the 70s slowing you down much. The Vegan Academy, when did that start? Main Street Vegan Academy was an outgrowth of my book, Main Street Vegan, which if you're interested in veganism or if you are vegan, I hope you'll take a look at it. I'm very, very proud of that book. I've written 13 books so far, and I think that one is probably closest to my heart. So um, that was published in 2012, and the Academy came uh, very shortly thereafter, also in 2012. And what we do is train vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. So the people who take the Main Street Vegan Academy course are already vegans, but they want to take their outreach to the next level. So many of them become practicing coaches and others are podcasting and influencing and writing books. And a lot of them start businesses, which I never thought at the beginning, because I'm not a very business type person. So the idea that something that I started 
could could spawn entrepreneurs. We got this wonderful quote from Forbes.com about how amazing we are starting small businesses. And it's so much fun to see my graduates and they're all over the world. They're in six continents, every, every continent except Antarctica. And so <laughs> we've got a vegan, I say we like it's mine, a vegan ice cream company in Mexico City, a vegan bodega in Philadelphia, a vegan cheese shop in Manhattan, a award-winning food truck on Long Island that is now also a restaurant, also award-winning, and then some other kind of interesting, different sorts of companies that you wouldn't think about. So somebody in the Buffalo area has started a vegan mall. It's kind of a shopping center and, and retail, all vegan. And then a lovely lady in Dallas, Kat Mendenhall, has a cowboy boot company. Because if you're in Dallas, you got to have some cowboy boots. <laughs> and these just tick all the boxes, you know, vegan, eco-friendly, made in America, custom designed. And she came up with the idea while she was here at the academy. We used to be in person. Now we're on Zoom. Zoom is really better because you don't have to spend money to get to New York. And we can have instructors from all over everywhere. So we have wonderful instructors and we cover every aspect of the vegan lifestyle. So certainly we have the ethical and the animal part and we have the health and nutrition. We've got medical doctors, dietitians who teach for us. And then the environment, which can be kind of depressing, but if we do this thing, we know we're doing something to help. So we teach vegan principles and then communication principles. You know all this stuff. How can you share it? How can you share it with clients? How can you share it with audiences? How can you share it online without being insufferable? You know, vegans don't necessarily have the best <laughs> reputation in the world. Uh, and then we have business principles. So if you do want to do this as a business, how you get started as a small business person, how you brand yourself, how you set yourself apart. So um, just very proud of everything that we do. And if anybody is interested in learning more, it's MainStreetVegan.com. <laughs> Getting a plug in early. <laughs> so in teaching at the academy and then previously and posthumously <laughs> teaching uh, yoga, are there some threads that run through the teaching process that you could share with our listeners? You know, for me, it's really about shining your light. I, and I learned this as a speaker because very often people would come up to me after a talk and say, oh, I'm so glad I was there to hear what you had to say, especially that part where you talked about forgiveness. And I'm like, forgiveness? Did I say anything <laughs> about forgiveness? And I learned that when people need something from you, if you're authentic, if you're given the best you've got, it almost doesn't matter what you say, they're going to get what they need to hear. And if that just happened once or twice, I would think it's a fluke. But it has happened dozens and dozens of times in my years as a speaker. So when I show up, on Tuesday and Thursday morning, super early, I'm just there to give the best I have to give. And obviously with something like Main Street Vegan Academy, there's all kinds of preparation and making sure the instructors are showing up on time and everything is going smoothly and all that in the background. But the real essence of it is number one, be prepared, know your stuff, because you can't teach what you don't have. And then just be real and let the light come through you. You can never go wrong that way. Be real. <laughs> that's great advice. I think that's true. We listen to people or videos or whatever it is, books we're reading, and everybody gets something that's personalized, even though the, the words are the same that everyone hears. We... We all hear things differently and perceive the world differently. That's a big teaching yeah. of yoga, of course. And even like when you read a book over again years later, it's as if it's a brand new book. Can't step in the same book twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Did you just come up with that? <laughs> yeah. Uh... Before we came online, you were mentioning that you 
had some mnemonic epiphany? I do, because when I first, I think it was my assistant had booked this and I was so excited to come on and talk about yoga and whatnot. And then when I realized what what it was about, I hadn't listened prior to that, my apologies. And I saw that this was your specialty. It's like, wow, that is so interesting. And then it was like, oh my gosh, am I qualified? So I went back and looked at my notes from yoga teacher training and it's like, oh my gosh, I did so much of this. So should I just tell uh, my mnemonic story? <laughs> so for me, because I was 70, I was a little bit intimidated by all the stuff that I would have to learn and know and so much of it in, in Sanskrit. And I knew I was going to need some help. So one thing that I very much believe in is, is the power and really the necessity of memorization. I had a seventh grade teacher who said that in almost every life, a time will come when you're alone or afraid. And in that time, if you have memorized poetry, scripture, what Mozart and Tchaikovsky sounds like in your head, you've got that with you in those times, and that's going to get you through. And that always stayed with me. So I think that just committing stuff to memory is important. So the first thing I did was commit to memory just a very few words. So when I think about knowing the Sanskrit names for the postures, it's kind of like playing bingo. If you've ever played bingo, hmm. in the middle of the card, there's a free square and everybody gets that. So the free square for knowing what these asana names are is asana because it's an all of them <laughs> and we all know that we know that's posture easy relaxed position so i figured okay that's one i got that and then i memorized four body parts because they show up over and over and over again so that was mukha face and uh shirsha head janyu knee and pada, leg or foot. Now, actually, pada does have a, a little memory game you can play because in English, we've got a pedestrian getting around by foot. We've got podiatrist, a foot doctor. So when you get those four, you're already there with several postures. So you've got a shirshasana, a headstand, janya shirshasana, head to knee pose, and adho mukha, and I can never say this dog word, svanasana, a downward dog. So that, that gives you just, just there a nice um, start. And then I memorized some other words which have to do with body positioning and that also show up in lots and lots of postures. So kona, which is angle, shows up a lot. Arda, half. Bada, bound. Parivrishta, rotated, supta, <laughs> reclining, utana, and that is an intentional stretch. And that one you could have a little memory game with because if you're really, really doing something that's taken a lot of, of energy, you go, ooh, so <laughs> utana, and then uh, upavishta, seated. So that's only 11 words to memorize. So it's a dozen, including asana. And you might choose a different dozen, but to just have that basis, you know a lot. And then we get on to more of the fun stuff and more of the games. And I just want to start with my very, very favorite one. I think it was the first one that I came up with because I didn't have to come up with it because it's right there. And I love this so much. And that is for king dancer pose. Nata Rajasana. So we all know that a Raj or a Raja is a king or a leader. We grew up with stories of Maharajas. But this guy, he's not a Raj. <laughs> he's a dancer. <laughs> Nata Rajasana. So I love that. That was my favorite. And that got me to thinking of some others. And we had some times in, in class where we did group gatherings and different people were coming up with different kinds of memory games. And I think that's really important. Some of these are so personal that they wouldn't help anybody but you, but it doesn't matter because you're the one <laughs> that is supposed to be uh, learning these. So in the course that I took, it was caught by, taught by two male, female uh, married couples. And one of the men was called Vera 
And he was so protective of his wife and his baby that Vera Bhadrasana, the warrior or the hero, just fit so well. So that was really easy from, from straight off. And then some of these do have the kind of, of um, English connection. So uh, Navasana, that's the boat. And so who's got a bunch of boats? Well, navies. And there's a part of a boat called the uh. nave. I mean, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. I'm as far from the ocean as you <laughs> could get, although I live in New York now. But it, even I know that a ship has a nave. So that, that one's helpful. And triangle, of course, or, or any of the postures that have that T-R-I, meaning three, those are easy. And then uh, wheel, uh, chakrasana, that's easy because I already knew chakras were wheels. And then some of them, some of the games that I've used are visual. So uh, for splits, hanumanasana, the first time I heard that that was the name for splits, I envisioned a monkey, because we know Hanuman, it's a wonderful monkey god from the Ramayana, a monkey doing splits. And now, not only does it help me remember the word, but I can't see anybody doing splits. And I actually see people doing splits a lot because my daughter is an aerialist. So I see all of her wonderful, you know, <laughs> pictures doing splits <laughs> on the aerial silks. And it's just like, but that's supposed to be a monkey. Monkey is supposed to do the splits. That's how it goes. <laughs> and um, another one that helped me a lot and that might be very personal to me, I don't know how much this is going to relate to other people, but in the system that I learn, cobra, locust, and bow always came as a set. That was the backward bending series. And I always felt that of those three, the one that was really doing the most for me physically was the locust pose because it just seemed to be so strengthening. I knew it was strengthening my back and, and it was good for the circulation. It was massaging internal organs. It just seemed so powerful and so health promoting. And so the word salubrious means healthy, comes from the Latin. <laughs> and so shalabhasana is like, yeah, you know, that's a health promoting posture. Now, if salubrious isn't a word that you think of very often, that, <laughs> that might not work for you, but uh, it works for me. And then I've got kind of, I've got a vegan story for, uh, for Bo. So Danya Shirshasana. Now, I don't like the idea of somebody coming around with a bunch of bows, especially if they are going to go hunting. So... <laughs> There's a lovely gentleman, passed away now, Professor Rinberry. He taught at the new school, and oh, yeah. he was a very dedicated vegan. And he used to tell the story that if you were a true practitioner of yoga or of any of the ahimsa religions of, of Vedic faith or Jainism or Buddhism, that ahimsa was always the highest principle. So if you were out in the forest and you saw that the deer went that away and the hunter comes and says, which way did the deer go? You could say, oh, he went <laughs> the other way. And you don't have to worry about the teaching that says you shouldn't lie because ahimsa is the highest teaching. And if that isn't good enough, you could actually let go of the teaching that says you shouldn't steal and you could just filch that bow or those arrows because <laughs> ahimsa is the highest teaching. And if it really gets bad and if there is absolutely nothing else you can do, you can let go of brahmacharya for the moment and seduce the hunter because if that distracts <laughs> him from killing the deer Ahimsa is the highest teaching. So when I was learning the word uh, uh, for, for Bo, a Danyarasana, it was, damn you for killing that deer. <laughs> Danyarasana, that's the Bo. <laughs> you, are, you are good with words. <laughs> wow. Um, where to go from that? Wow. I'm still trying to absorb everything you just said. So when you're teaching, do you give a lot of 
philosophy in your building? Yes. Or is, is it more just the... <laughs> you know, yeah. that's the thing. When it's a community class, you can pretty much do whatever you want. I mean, to me, this is a gift and I'm going to give the gift the way I would want to receive it. So yeah, there, there's always a Dharma talk. In the tradition in which I was taught, the standard class includes eye exercises followed by rubbing your palms together and resting your hands over your eyes and absorbing that prana. And during that time, and I always tell people if they want to rest their elbows on their knees, they can do that so they can be real comfy. And then I do some kind of little Dharma talk. So it's either something about health that is maybe seasonal, like, you know, now we're coming into fall, we're coming into a Vata season in, in Ayurveda. So I've been talking a lot about things that we can do to stay healthy through this transition and support our Vata dosha and be nice and grounded. Or sometimes it's philosophical. And sometimes I get a little bit of my animal rights, uh, <laughs> vegan stuff in there. Never, <laughs> never in a pushy kind of way, because one thing I've learned about that is that everybody wants to be kind and everybody thinks that they're kind. We just see it differently. I mean, you and I, before we stopped eating animal foods, we saw ourselves as kind people. And for somebody to say, oh, you're a terrible person. It's like, how far is that going to get you? So instead, I, I just try to kind of weave it in, bring it in through the back door and and help people to see that they really are rooted in ahimsa in their own soul. So yeah, there, there's quite a lot of philosophy. It doesn't take up a lot of time because these are early morning classes. So we just go for 45 minutes and to get in some breathing and a little relaxation and then plenty of postures, which is what they come for. You know, most people, they're not really looking for philosophy. They're looking to feel fitter and feel better. And Yet to me, without the philosophy, it's not yoga. I mean, I've heard it said that calisthenics, if you use the breath and you have the intention that this is going to improve your body for the benefit of your soul, calisthenics are yoga. But I don't know. To me, yoga is all about the connection of the body or in yoga, of course, all the bodies and our our ultimate identity in that immortal Atman. Well, I think we're pretty good. Did you have anything else about memory or advice for new yoga teachers or teachers in general? Well, just remember the good stuff because we are somehow wired. I, I have learned through um, anthropology that because life was so hard for humans in prehistoric times, we selectively focus on the negative. Oh, that thing I did was so stupid. And we can go over and over and over that. But for a good life, and certainly to be an uplifting yoga teacher, we acknowledge that stuff. Like, yeah, guess what? I did a stupid thing. And you know what? I'm going to do a stupid thing next week too. But mostly I am well-meaning I am grounded in the spirit. I am grounded in ahimsa. I am grounded in selfless service. And if you can bring forth those memories, then that's what you can impart to your students. And so whether you mess up on the Sanskrit or whether you do what I did the other day, which was put an entirely unneeded downward dog in a sun salutation, you're you're right on time, <laughs> doing fine, and you're you're blessed with this treasure that is yoga, this ancient treasure that is coming through us to pass along to other people, which is pretty magical. Wow. Someone needed that downward dog. <laughs> you can find out all about Victoria's offerings at MainStreetVegan.com, but I wanted to let her tell you about two of the things she's really excited about these days her podcast, and the movie she's co-written and is working on getting out into the world. I, with a lot of help from others, did the Main Street Vegan podcast for almost 10 years, and it was a radio podcast hybrid on Unity Online Radio, the Unity Churches or a very liberal Protestant denomination, actually founded by very devoted vegetarians 
who uh, got to know Swami Vivekananda at the Parliament of the World Religions in 1893. So there's a lot of yoga. There's reincarnation. Unity is very cool. So this <laughs> my podcast was hosted on Unity Online Radio. And then they decided that the podcast uh, radio hybrid was just not going to work and, and was not financially um, feasible for them any longer. So they closed and I had done 475 episodes, almost 10 years. Oh and I thought, okay, you know, I did this. That's a thing. It's done. And, you know, I had other stuff going on. But then another network <laughs> came after me and it's hard for me to say no sometimes. So I thought, okay, mainstream vegan, you know, I've done that. Let me, let me do something different. So I, I did a year of a show called meetings with remarkable women, which was really fun to do, except because I know so many vegans, 85% of those remarkable women were vegan. So I was doing a <laughs> vegan podcast without a vegan title and people kept saying, can you bring back mainstream vegan? So yes, I did. I brought back Main Street Vegan in um, mid-September of, of 2023. My first guest was Colleen Patrick Goudreau. And oh, nice. we're just, we're going again, you know, we're episode 476 and we're going to go on and we're going to do 500 and have a big celebration. And then I don't know, maybe we'll do a thousand. Maybe by then I can retire. But yeah, uh, Main Street <laughs> Vegan, it, just, it covers every aspect. And because I'm the host and because I want to be interested, it's got a lot of yoga in it. It's got a lot of spirituality. It's got a lot of really practical health stuff. Like, you know, how can you live in a way that gives you more of an opportunity for vitality for as long as you're here? And then, of course, because I am an animal advocate, we've got that. So it's a beautiful podcast. So please uh, check us out. It's on uh, everywhere that you find your podcast, both our new new version happening now and all of those 475 archival episodes you were on. So you can go back in the archives and look up Derek. I was. You were. You were. <laughs> a long time ago. It was probably like 2013 or 14, something like that. Before we go, you mentioned that you were working on a movie, and I'd love to have you talk about that. Oh, a bit. thank you so much. I am so excited. And I can really talk up this movie and say how fabulously great it is, because even though I'm the co-writer, it was really my husband's original story. So when I brag, I'm bragging on his behalf. It's called Miss Liberty. And it's about a cow who escapes from a slaughterhouse in the Midwest and all the human drama that ensues. So what is really cool about this movie is that it is a family feature film and it's a great story and people will want to see it because it's a great story. But you also cannot miss some of the issues about the way we use animals, about the workers' issues in slaughterhouses. And I do have to tell you, because it's my husband's brilliance, that Miss Liberty has a surprise <laughs> ending that is just as good as Sixth Sense. If you remember that old M. Night Shyamalan movie with the best surprise ending on record, uh, yeah, Miss Liberty is kind of <laughs> like that too. So we are going to be doing a crowdfunding uh, effort in November to really get this thing going. And if you want to know more about Miss Liberty, just go to that same website, MainStreetVegan.com. And there's a thing that'll say, want to be a Main Street Vegan? And that gets you into our database. And then when things are going with Miss Liberty and other sorts of, of uh, things that I do, I do Ayurveda retreats and whatnot here and there, you will be informed of that. And then coming to a theater or streaming whatever <laughs> near you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for letting me talk about that, Derek. I'm so excited because, you know, oh, there's just excited. something about a new project with huge potential that is uh, really energizing. Thank you for being on my show. And I'm very um, impressed with all that you've done in your life and all that you're doing right now and how this yoga and veganism combination has kept you so young and vibrant. <laughs> I feel like people say that to me and I'm a baby in my fifties, you know? <laughs> well, I have always <laughs> just Derek, I, I know we've never, you know, gotten to be buddy buddies, but your energy has just always been so pure 
you know, your, your intentions, your, your uplift, your evolutionary status. I don't know really how to put it right. It's just that whenever I would go to an event, you were there usually taking pictures. It just always, it just lifted things up. So you are the real deal. And I've really appreciated having this time with you. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Don't Forget Yoga podcast. Your time and attention is deeply appreciated. Very deeply. If you like the show, please tell your yoga teacher friends about it or leave us a review. If you have a yoga mnemonic to share or anything else you want to talk about, I'd love to hear from you. Leave a voicemail at don'tforgetyoga.com right now during this guitar solo. Our listeners are the best. Until next time, refrain from being someone else's pain or, or disdain. disdain. Keep your third eye on, on the game. game. Each line's main. main. Train your brain Don't until yoga easily remains. In other words, Don't forget. No, don't forget. Don't forget it. Mnemonics.